everybody. I'm Dr. Scott Masson with Paideia Today, here with my colleague as ever, Bill Friesen. We are here to speak about Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. For those of you who have not heard of this work, it is a very modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden to their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public. Who could object to such a modest proposal, Bill? Oh, certainly not me, uh, but uh, let me lead off with uh, the elephant in the room here. What exactly is the modest proposal? Let me be upfront about that. This is the proposal that the impoverished Irish who are struggling with economic crises and the crises of famine and other things like this, who are groaning under the weight of their state and lot in life, uh, can do much to alleviate their suffering if only they would sell their babies for food. Uh, that's correct, you heard me um, exactly as I meant to be heard, which is to say we are going to be talking about eating babies, we're going to be talking about baby recipes, we're going to be talking about factory lines, we're going to be talking about uh, baby husbandry, I suppose, though he does not use that term in the essay itself. Um, and every time I teach this text, I warn my students about the front end that this essay is a satire. And that means something very specific, especially in the 18th century. And that Jonathan Swift, even though this is delivered in um, classical deadpan style, nevertheless is not actually in sincerity advocating that the Irish sell and or eat their babies. Um, he's doing this to show the sheer inhumanity of the solutions being proposed to the quote unquote Irish problem. And yet, even though I give an extensive warning, along with an explanation of why this is satire and what he really intends, and then I send them out to read the text, nevertheless, every year when they read it, there comes back a cadre amongst my students uh, who are shocked and outraged and furious and complaining um, and stage some kind of protest thing in the wake of this, and then I have to explain it all over again. So I am oftentimes bemused by this response. But let's talk a little bit also about the context in which we're encountering Jonathan you're, you're, Swift. You're kinder than I. I don't warn them. I just let them read it. <laughs> <laughs> I just get tired of all the emotional heavy lifting at the far wow. end if I don't uh, prepare the ground a little bit at the front. Um, we are now in an age very, very different than the age of John Milton and indeed Herbert and Dunn and Shakespeare and what have you. We have moved into a completely unique period in English history here. And it is a period which is now, in my view, radically understudied. There are very few scholarly travelers, literary travelers to the 18th century. If you go to any large university and uh, peruse their faculty uh, in their English departments, you would be hard pressed to find at best more than one specialist in the 18th century, and many of them have none whatsoever. Uh, and this to me is kind of a, presents sort of a perverse appeal because I like undiscovered countries. I like undiscovered cultures. I like forgotten things and uh, re revivifying them in the light of scholarly inquiry. And so the long 18th century is a great place for me to do a lot of this sort of thing. I find it very gratifying, hmm. uh, but let me just for the sake, I mean, this is not a, a podcast about uh, dates and, and history and stuff like that, but just to give the listeners a bit of scaffolding um, into which they can arrange their thinking uh, of this discussion. We start very, very clearly with this era. It's 1660. A lot of other eras are kind of fuzzy and what have you, but not this one here. When we're talking about the long 18th century, starting with uh, 1660, the restoration of Charles II and the monarchy, and to a large extent, the operational framework of the aristocracy in England, which has been removed during the interregnum when uh, the Commonwealth was ruling. And uh, it's back now, Arist aristocratic uh, management is not only back, um, but uh, aristocratic dominance in many spheres, again, comes back. A lot of people are under the impression that as time goes by, the power and sway and influence of the aristocracy on English letters and indeed English life more generally speaking, diminishes and diminishes and diminishes as the years go by. It's not that way at all. We had that English Civil War that you and I spoke about, mm -hmm. um, which blew English culture into flinders. And um, so when the aristocracy comes back, they come back 
with a vengeance. That's how I describe it to my student. And they are here and they are loud and proud about their aristocratic values and everything that goes along with this. They oftentimes put on rather hair raising displays of decadence, um, which are deliberately designed to infuriate middle class sensibilities and things like that. Um, is a very fractious era in that sense. So this is the restoration period, also known sometimes as the Augustan period. Yeah. Named after the Caesar Augustus when uh, he presided over a golden age of the Roman Empire. So also they said Charles II is presiding over a golden age in uh, English uh, history. And this ends with either 1700 or 1714, however you choose to draw that second line. The second line is much harder to, to draw historically. Then we move into the 18th century proper. And of course, we typically end our discussions about uh, the 18th century um, somewhere around 1793, 1797, something like this. And then we move into that new era of the Romantics. So that's the blocking in here. Interesting. And this, yeah, and this era has so many distinctives about it. This is the era when uh, we see the rise, as it were, of the cult of reason. Initially, we see the rise of French neoclassicism, which has a huge influence on English culture. Um, we see the rise of all sorts of new literary forms. This is, the, this is the period which gave us the magazine. This is the period which gave us the newspaper. This is the period which, where we see the rise of the novel. Um, there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff developing in, uh, in this period here. This is the period where we see the rise of journaling and diaries and things of this nature and that being turned into its own literary art form. So there's a lot going on in the 18th century, even though a lot of people find it stuffy and boring and quiet. Um, it's called also, it has many different names. It's also called the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. Do you want to talk, talk to us a little bit, Dr. Masson, about why it's called those things? Well, um, it's, a, it's a term that's used after the fact, um, used by Voltaire and company. Um, and uh, the those that were in the forefront often call themselves the philosophes, the philosophers. Uh, the philosophy that they uh, propounded was very different from the philosophy of Aristotle and that of antiquity. Um, it had a particular edge to it and a particular um, methodology and to some degree was, was pinned together with something you already mentioned, the restoration of Charles II, because along with the restoration of Charles came the uh, Royal Society. In 1660, it was founded. This was a society of gentlemen scientists um, that were using um, um, science to guide policy uh, and, and not just to advance what we think as the detached use of reasoning for the purposes of inventing things or discovering things, but to use this evidence based on science for policies for the ruling uh, cadre of individuals, in other words, the aristocracy going forward. And, and so science and aristocracy to some degree go hand in glove and they, they have ever since that day to some degree, the, the gentleman scientist is still sort of an ideal. It's certainly presented that way in Victorian England uh, and all the way up until the mid 20th century, at which point because of uh, the atrocities in the Second World War comes to a little bit of a crash uh, and uh, still has not got uh, free of some of the negative connotations that come with that uh, for good reason. But um, yeah, the age of reason is connected with those. Things. One other thing I would say that is important or two things that struck me is, are important to add to what you said. In 1688, there's the so-called Glorious Revolution, which is the Protestant, the return of William and Mary after Charles is gone, and a sort of an, um, a move back towards Anglicanism rather than the Catholic little swing for, uh, you know, for the, that intervening period of 28 years. And that's important in the context of what we are going to talk about, uh, Swift and the Catholic Anglican conflict there. Uh, and the second thing is just the relation of Ireland to England, um, and that's from the Civil War period. Uh, Cromwell and his Republican army invaded Ireland to put down uh, a political threat uh, off the shores of Catholic insurrectionists and so forth, and left there um, English um, aristocrats, and he granted them 
land in order to keep the peace, as it were. And that is a legacy that Swift is also uh, pointing to um, as, as a political reality. So there are English aristocrats who are the landlords, and there's a poor Catholic peasantry. And at the same time, Europe is also embroiled in, you know, uh, the uh, religious conflicts of the past. They're sort of hanging over there, and there, and and Spain, which he alludes to at the outset, um, has a pretender to the British uh, monarchy, making him a political threat. And so all of those things are are lying around. So there are religious conflicts, political conflicts. There's the uh, grand society, the age of reason, uh, often centered around the court of Louis the Fourteenth, uh, the so-called Sun King. Uh, Louis XIV, uh, represented by the palace that he builds in Versailles, with the House of Mirrors and Versailles being such an important uh, place for treaties and so forth uh, throughout the 18th and 19th century. Um, all of it represented by reasoning, but reasoning now is connected more with mathematics and mathematics as the cure-all for every human ill. Um, if it's only followed, the mathematics will lead us to the best human solution. And that has is so strongly held by the aristocrats that we can see it form the backdrop of Mr. Swift's appeal to aristocratic values, Christian values, and yet without any sense of contradiction, uh, considering things along the lines of calculation and statistics. He sounds like a he sounds like a modern day um, urban planner. Or, or a sociologist, perhaps. It's that, that same sort of air. And so my students, they're, after they get over their horrid shock, which I don't prepare them for because I'm, I'm less kind than you, perhaps. <laughs> it could not be said very often. Um, <laughs> um, after they get over that shock, they find it remarkably uh, relevant to contemporary discussions. Just seems to be talking about the same sorts of issues that they will deal with in relation to government agencies and life today. Yeah, a lot of people think of social engineering as a brand new thing that is germane to the postmodern era and whatever we're in right now and, and, and times like this. But in point of fact, there were a number of individuals who raised Jonathan Swift's ire, which was not hard to do, by the way, um, who were uh, who were social engineers of his day and he was shocked by not just what they were proposing but the nature of what they were proposing and the machinery by which they uh, came to the conclusions and plans that they did this this horrified swift um and he responded in a very typical way we should also mention here that uh, the glorious revolution was glorious because it involved so little bloodshed right that's why it's the glorious revolution um a couple of other points I make with my students about this age. You talk about uh, how reason will point the way forward, and particularly mathematics is a great way to decide courses of action for human society and also in, for individuals. And this is indeed the case. There's a sense which, whereby reason is, for many of these writers, for many of these thinkers, the only sure way that you can decide your way forward here. And of course, what you encounter in the modest proposal is a seemingly, at least on the surface, eminently rational, scientific, uh, statistically um, gir uh, girded argument for the things that he's proposing. So he's, he's sought to give you the most urbane and rational tone in which he delivers content of the most hair-raising contrast to that, which is extreme and horrific and nightmarish and, and things like this. So that's the tension he's deliberately cultivating in a modest proposal. I tell my students also that, that a lot of them remark on the writers of the 18th century as coming across as enormously snobby. That's not accidental. I tell them if you're ever in London, go to see what I consider to be the best uh, portrait gallery in the world, the National Portrait Gallery there in, in London off of Trafalgar Square. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you go into the section on the age of reason and look at the faces uh, looking, smiling down on you from there, they, all, they are mostly all smiling, it's a bit unusual, uh, but they're looking down at you, almost invariably the eyes are aimed down at you and there's, it's not really a smile, it's a smirk of somebody who knows better. Um, and I said that that, that communicates the spirit of the age in ways that long disputations would never do. Just have a look at the face, the smug expression on that individual's face, 
yeah, that kind of catches what we're talking about here. Um, could I say, could I add one thing? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I always say as well. And it, it, I think it's, I, I came across this decades ago, a observation and I can't recall where I found it, but, um, I've used it ever since the, the, the model for the Royal society is nullius in verba and that it's Latin, but it translates roughly into take no one's word for it. And it leads to the experimental method of trial and error, right? So you don't, you don't appeal to authorities. This is an, I, I, so you don't say Aristotle said, or it says in the Bible that, or Thomas Aquinas said, or you don't appeal to authorities or the arguments made by authority figures. You use your own testing through the scientific method in order to verify what things are. Now, what you get from this are an array of facts. These are things that are uh, FACRA is something that you do or make. It's something you can make true as in demonstrate with your own two eyes. And the methodology of this period is so strong and convincing to those that practice it that they throw off traditional argumentation altogether and appeals to authorities, even scriptural authority, uh, fall flat in the face of appeals to what you can prove with your own eyes. And in fact, uh, David Hume will eventually dispute miracles and so forth on this very basis. I can't repeat those. Therefore, they might be true. They might not be true, but they're irrelevant because they don't uh, meet the bar of scientific reasoning. So that, th that I think is rather telling. And with that, what falls away isn't just theology then, but also our whole view of human nature and ethics that goes along with it. And it follows a different trajectory and the trajectory that is that of mathematical ways of thinking. And that includes about human nature. And this is the best example of it, certainly early on. And we have later ones that you you spoke of already. But this is, as I say, it seems contemporary because we still deal with this exact sort of thinking. Yeah, I think what you're saying there, Scott, is uh, extremely useful. It's very illuminating because um, it gives us our earliest roots of the, uh, the often... Uh, the sense of animus of the scientific worldview um, and the scientists specifically towards things like revealed religion and inherited traditional authorities. Those are two things that they reject um, quite strenuously in the 18th century and adopt uh, oftentimes very contradictory positions to that. Um, so you'll find that there's a kind of a rationalism that infuses the discourse of the age. Uh, and there's an immediate response of hostility towards anything that smacks of uh, authoritative appeal or indeed a, a revealed truth uh, of a religious nature or, or anything like this. And this gives rise to a couple of really important concepts without which you can't really understand the 18th century. One of them is the rise of positivism, which you've already alluded to um, relatively directly, which is this notion that the only thing that you should be taking into account as you search for the truth and therefore the way forward um, are things which your senses can test and measure. And this is where the, ex uh, the experimental model of knowledge uh, gains so much of its weight and authority from this kind of approach of positivism. The only things in life that are valid concerns are those that you can actually put your five senses on, test, measure, move forward with. Um, and by way of extension, this means that all knowledge is uh, a posteriori knowledge, no uh, a priori knowledge. Um, and that's going to blow up in time. That is not a sustainable worldview. And again, if you don't know that, you don't understand perhaps one of the levels of invective that Swift is deploying in a modest proposal, because it is in some senses uh, an attack on rationalism and positivism and things of this nature as well. And this also leads to another side point. I don't want to dwell on this too long because I want to get to the text, um, which is the rise of 18th century deism which is the notion that the only legitimate, most valid revelation uh, of who God is, is in his creation, uh, and in, uh, specifically in, in the stuff of nature and things of this sort, and as we can measure these things and track these things and what have you, um, which is um, also uh, turns out to be a dead end in many different senses here. 
uh, but we have to understand that this also informs a lot of the talk that we're encountering in the 18th century, even amongst theologians and people of that sort. Jonathan Swift himself, of course, uh, is a priest. Um, he managed a parish, a, a small, tiny parish, small, tiny church uh, for a number of years. Um, and so he is continuously thinking of theological matters as well. He's very re well read uh, in these areas. Um, he's very learned uh, when it comes to theology. So these are also issues that are on his mind. The last thing we need to say before we dive into this is to give our listeners a little bit of machinery to understand the literary models that he's diving into, because yet another name for the 18th century is the age of satire. Yeah. Students can be forgiven for thinking as they're reading through a reading list of 18th century literature that these writers are incapable of saying anything sincerely. All they do is satire. All they do is mock. Uh, all they do is ridicule. Uh, they are paralyzed and poisoned by irony at every literary turn. That's an understandable initial response to what's going on here. But we have to make a few distinctions as well when it comes to satire. Remember, satire is predictably authoritatively de defined for the rest of posterity by writers in this age. Alexander Pope most significantly, I think I've given this uh, brief uh, definition of satire uh, on an earlier occasion. He said, satire is the ridicule of human folly for the sake of reformation. That's what satire is. So it's, it's relatively short but it's kind of pointed. And he contrasts that with mere sarcasm, the evil twin of satire, which is the ridicule of human folly for sheer sadistic delight. So that's one distinction we need to make right off the top here. This work that we're reading, The Modest Proposal and the horrors it's communicating to us are done in that satirical model with a view towards some kind of uh, reformation, social reformation, economic reformation, cultural reformation, things of that sort. That's why Swift mocks as savagely as he does, which brings me to the second distinction before we get into the text itself, uh, which is between Horatian and Juvenalian comedy. Sometimes we make a distinction between Juvenalian and Horatian satire. Juvenalian, of course, getting its name from the, the Roman writer, is a form of satire which is harsh, savage, biting, um, oftentimes cruel as it generates humor with these sorts of things. Um, whereas Horatian is a much sort of gentler approach to comedy. Yes, the people that you're uh, that are being portrayed in this literature uh, are doing ridiculous things, uh, and they're all laughable things. And uh, you know, but at the end of the day, they're all kind of lovable. That's not part of juvenilian comedy. It is part of Horatian comedy. When we're reading a modest proposal, it falls solidly into satire, and it falls solidly into juvenilian humor. So these are the models. Doctor Masson, did you want to? Say anything one, more. One, well, one final, if we're going to define satire, this one's from uh, Swift himself. I believe it's Swift anyway. Satire is a sort of glass wherein beholders do generally discover everybody's face but their own, which is the chief reason for that kind of reception it receives in the world, and that so very few are offended by it. That sounds like something Swift would say. Yeah, and it, and it, and it really what it, it is is uh, based on what Jesus says and when he uses satire uh, of the Pharisees. They mm -hmm. assume that he must be speaking about the bad people when he's in fact talking about the good people or those that see or think of themselves as good, namely the Pharisees themselves. Right? Yeah. And you see this all, all over the place nowadays um, in our age of virtue signaling, where everyone in the room is smiling and nodding along with the individual who's firing off an invective of one kind or another. And you're thinking to yourself, actually, you realize that that individual is talking to you, right? <laughs> so when you smile and nod, uh, you accuse yourself in that process, Yeah. Um, which I find perhaps quite illegitimately quite humorous. But nevertheless, Swift has a point and it's timeless. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where I would go with this. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a short. It's it's relatively short and sweet. Um, do we want to speak anything about the uh, the literary devices that he uses? You you mentioned that it was a satire. What is this? Uh, we use I hear the word satire bandied about these days as well. Bill, people are so called satirists. I often don't find much by way of satire in these satirists i feel i find more lampoon uh some ridicule but very little by way of satire but maybe that's my definition how do you how do you define 
uh, what, what's the necessary precondition for satire to take place? Yeah, that's actually that's a very good point. And this is why I'm continuously distinguishing between satire and sarcasm. Okay. Um, because a lot of what I'm hearing nowadays, even in quite learned circles, uh, intellectual circles, political circles, and so on, doesn't qualify as classical satire because there's no aim at reformation. You don't want to build anything, let alone any one. You, you just want to tear them down. There you go. Um, if it helps uh, the listeners think about the mean girls in high school when they were uh, saying to you know the, the the girl they're picking on a nice sweater, they're not being satirical. They're not trying to help her with her fashion choices and stuff like that. They're being sarcastic. It's a vicious uh, impulse that drives it. And as I said, sarcasm is the evil twin of satire. Sarcasm is the tearing of the flesh. Satire has an assumed common human moral nature that it is holding somebody up to uh and as as swift says a sort of glass in other words a yeah. mirror a mirror it has a, a view towards rebuilding a degree of legitimate self-respect on the part of the individuals who are mocked uh ridiculed as it were uh yeah. so ultimately it comes out of a positive uh, sense of love for the individuals who are being ridiculed. So hopefully yep. you know, when you were a kid, your parents might have spoken to you satirically when you did something boneheaded, uh, but with a view to building you back up so you don't do the thing that is destructive or not helpful or embarrassing or whatever it might be. Uh, but then I'm sure everyone has had experiences of being on the receiving end of sarcasm. And nowadays it's really quite clear the distinction between those two things um, as they're being deployed in reality. Uh, Whereas when you're looking at this kind of satire here in the 18th century, it's of a much more sophisticated and informed sort. And so sometimes the authors are deliberately and strategically messing with whether or not they're actually deploying satire or sarcasm. And you have a hard time figuring out, okay, you say it's satire, but I'm really not seeing that demonstrated in the results of what you're aiming for or the manner in which you express yourself or what have you. But it can become kind of an interesting debate. Is this genuinely satirical? That's, Whereas nowadays it's not debatable. It just occurred to me, I, I said sarcasm is literally the tearing of the flesh in, in Greek. Um, Swift satire here is, is commending the tearing of the flesh. So that's why it probably <laughs> is in that area in between where it does seem awfully sarcastic um, yes. because th that is precise and obviously there's hyperbole involved they're not actually eating the irish babies right now but they might as well be is what he's suggesting because they've taken everything else and he makes that clear towards the very end of the the essay uh where where do you want to dig into this then bill well i, I like you i like talking about the rhetorical acumen that okay. Swift deploys here. He starts off by generating a degree of sympathy for the oppressed Irish. He's describing their circumstance, describing their situation um, in a manner that even the most callous British reader or English reader would find um, affecting in some sense. So he sets the, them up uh, sympathetically and then he does a very interesting thing when he responds to it so he sets up the sympathy for them and then all of a sudden he gives you the unthinkable proposal i have an idea to help these poor people and of course you're already feeling for them and then he says the monstrous thing um and i think that's a very clever setup because he's going to sacrifice the narrator's position esteem in the eye of the reader in order to make his point um, so essentially, he's throwing himself on his own sword in order to do this. He, his job is to make himself sound like a cold-hearted, monstrous villain. And the better he can do that, the more effective this piece is going to be. So I find it an interesting psychological turn uh, right at the front end. Um, and also, we're playing around with the old appeals that always get talked about since the time of Aristotle between logos, ethos, and pathos. Um, the tone that he is using seems to be nothing but sheer scientific objective professionalism that's what you're getting here there's no over the top tone to what he's saying so it sounds like the tone of logos um but in point of fact as he's describing the content the content goes to the opposite extreme and des uh, describes things which evoke the extreme of ethos and pathos on the other hand and of course swift is very clever about how he does that the idea of uh, the poor suffering Irish or devouring their babies uh, draws a strong visceral response, ideally, 
from the reader. This is also, I should mention in passing here, the, uh, the British are famous for their deadpan humor. And this is kind of a demonstrative, a demonstrative power piece of deadpan. It's one of the greatest of all times. I don't know if anybody else has had uh, the opportunity to be on the receiving end of British deadpan humor, let alone satire, but it's a unique experience that, uh, that's uh, not easy to forget. <laughs> totally enjoyable, mm. but savage. But savage, yes. Um, to indulge in a personal anecdote, I used to have a supervisor uh, who was a British woman, and she had the ability to say the most absolutely hair-raising things, things I won't even repeat here on the podcast. Um, she was an older woman too, uh, but she would say them with complete deadpan and her delivery was so controlled and calm and urbane that you couldn't really credit your ears sometimes. Did I really hear her say what I just think she said? And she was trying to be funny and shocking. And after you got used to it, it was a magnificent form of humor. It was absolutely hilarious. But if you were not an initiate, you were entirely at sea. Shock and awe would follow. So, yeah. Well, it's a it's a dying art, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, there is something to be said for saying something indirectly, and that's what irony really is. It, it it's saying one thing uh, and appearing to say something else. Yeah. It, and, and so it's it's highly effective in the sense that it does exactly what I said. Swift said they think that they are seeing somebody else's face other than their own. So they're not immediately offended. And at the same time, when it when they think about it, and this is the good thing about satire, it invites you to think then, because the immediate sense is that this is talking about somebody else. And then on further reflection, it's clear that it isn't. And so your immediate response of loathing for the man who's proposing the modest proposal soon comes back upon yourself reflexively when you think actually everything that he is proposing I'm already effectively doing and wherein is the boundary between where I stand and where I thought this loathsome individual stands and there is no ground there more or less yeah. so that, that that then you have to do a, a total rethink of where your ethic your ethics stand and so forth and yeah, that's and what he wants yeah, in the great age of reason, logos is king, um, and it is a, an authoritarian, if not totalitarian, king of the 18th century mindset and the approaches to the Irish uh, crisis here. Um, and it was the divorce of logos from ethos, from ethics, that I think to a large extent so shocked and incensed uh, Jonathan Swift when he was writing this text. And you're right, uh, the loathing that you develop in here for the writer uh, can, if you're at all honest with yourself, morph very quickly into self-loathing. And in an age of continuous affirmation, the idea of loathing, on the other hand, being the, the reformatory tool of choice here uh, is something, again, that shocks a lot of my students. They don't like the idea that they should be reformed by a negative impulse, a negative view of themselves. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it works. Um, what yeah, else the, the loathing about? and this is it's really good this comment because the loathing comes from an idea of love, right? I love this, therefore I hate this. Mm -hmm. But if I hate this and I see of myself as an, a loving individual, then I'm torn between my idea of seeing myself as constantly affirming and a very positive person and yet loathing this person and yet, I see the person that I'm loathing is actually me. So what do I do with this? So you're torn all about. I, I don't think it loses its effect. Why don't I get, cite a few passages here? Yeah, absolutely. Note the gentlemanly tone. I shall now therefore humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. I've been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young healthy child, well nursed, is at a year old a most delicious, nutrition, nourishing and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve as a fricassee or a ragu. I do, do therefore humbly offer it to public considerations that of the 120,000 children already computed, 20,000 may be reserved for breed, whereof only one fourth part to be males, which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine, 
and my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages. Therefore, one male will be sufficient to serve four females, that the remaining 100,000 may, uh, uh, may at a year old be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune throughout the kingdom, always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month, so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends, and when the family dines alone, the fore or hind quarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little pepper or salt will be very good, boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium that a child just born will weigh 12 pounds, and in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increaseth to 28 pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear and therefore very proper to landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. I'll stop there. Uh -huh. Note the language of computation. Note the language uh, in which he compares the uh, Irish Catholics to uh, livestock, to speaking of, of uh, servicing and so forth and speaking of, of everything in terms of numbers without any moral considerations with equating people to animals all of these things happen without a uh, without a pause or a consideration which is why it's so horrific but also so powerful yeah one of the things that comes across and this is a very pressing point for our own times is we can actually trace both the method and the results of systematic dehumanization, which I would argue is an endemic danger in our own age as we uh, begin to reduce our perception of the other increasingly to mere type rather than an individual with individual value and status as such. Um, so he starts off talking about the Irish as people. Now, as you just demonstrated here, he's talking about them as livestock as animals they're not people anymore they're animals they are to use uh the nazi language here they are kind of an untermensch um and then from there they're reduced further then they're meat um they're not even animals anymore they're just meat and then they're reduced even further the meat's a commodity that's all they are so all of a sudden you have the language of commodification and you can actually trace the stages as swift breaks this down this is by now a wearying pattern in human behavior, human culture, social uh, social behavior that we've seen time and again. And perhaps it is a timeless uh, tendency. But we, here we are made aware of the absolutely horrific outcomes of this sort of gradual dehumanization and commodification of the individual. Where does that lead us? It always leads us to horror and nightmare. That's where it leads us. The other thing I should say is you're right to point out um, the computational language. This is the very verbiage of a social engineer, of a bureaucrat. And this is another thing I oftentimes tell my students about Jonathan Swift's age. It is the greatest age of the bureaucrat. Uh, there might be more bureaucrats now, but this is where they held some of the most influence that they have ever held in English culture, if not English society. And not only was it an enormously bureaucratic age with protocols and bylaws and rules for everything. Propriety ruled large in the 18th century, and that includes bureaucratic propriety. Um, and the bureaucrat can seem as if he or she has no uh, ethical skin in the game. They're just they're there to do a job, and their job is very machine-like. And so this is very machine-like language again. And again, it stands as, as a sort of a warning, because one of the side facts about bureaucracy and the rise of bureaucracy in the 18th century in Europe, never mind England, uh, it, uh, in England specifically, it was a extremely corrupt bureaucracy, deliberately corrupt bureaucracy, whose corruption was actually used to catalyze its efficiency, ironically. Um, and again, this is something to really understand the 18th century mindset. So here we have the here we have the bureaucrat explaining a bureaucratic solution to the Irish problem. Um, what else do we want to say about that? Also, notice we have the language of cuisine, um, talking about yummy, oh, delicious things we can make. That's right, we can make a ragu out of a baby. That had never occurred to me before. Thank you, Jonathan Swift. Um, and as you noted at the beginning of today's podcast, very soon we're going to be hit by a, a continuous deluge 
of statistical facts, numbers, calculations, these sorts of things. These can sound very, very convincing until you remember that they're all in the service of eating infants. Um, and the mind, as you read through Swift, the mind begins to increasingly develop a kind of a dual personality. You, there's the shocked, horrified individual over here who knows at a certain level that this is monstrous. And yet there is this calm, reasoned part of your brain, which is simultaneously being cultivated, um, which finds everything very convincing simply through the means in which the argument is expressed. So it's the means themselves that are going to be doing the convincing rather than the content of what's actually being proposed. And this points up yet another danger when it comes to um, culture, art, human language, and things like this. Uh, when the means becomes the message, to quote McLuhan, um, you're actually opening the door on some scary things. And maybe we shouldn't be celebrating that quite as avidly as we do sometimes. But this is uh, what happens with the computational methods because you can't calculate, uh, you can't calculate purpose and meaning. Um, uh, these are not things that can be demonstrated in a lab. These are things that are thereby excluded from consideration in the calculation. He adds into it a little bit uh, of, I would say, English um, contempt for the Irish as being more than just a political threat, though. There is also the anti-Catholic animus that is in, inherent, in the, and, and he almost does it as a, a snide comment at the sort of thing that one would say to another Englishman, uh, Protestant. So he, he notes that infant's flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March, and a little before and a little after. For we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent than at any other season. Therefore, reckoning a year after Lent, the markets will be more glutted than usual. Because mm -hmm. the number of popish infants is at, th at least three to one in this kingdom, and therefore it will have one other collateral advantage by lesser, lessening the number of papists among us. Savage. Yes. Again, this is something that a lot of my students wrestle with uh, when they're reading 18th century literature, because it is the great age of aristocratic domination uh, and aristocratic sensibilities dominating certain fields of human endeavor to be sure. There grew up very distinctive aristocratic forms of art, for instance, the, the comedy of manners and stuff like this. Um, so the, the aristocratic culture has this imprint upon the 18th century. It's also, as I said, the, the great age of propriety, of rules, of etiquette. It's fussy. It cares about tiny little details and things like this. It's, it's a natural fit with the bureaucratic culture in which it swims. And yet, because it seems such a genteel culture because of those things, uh, a lot of my students are shocked by the really hair-raising uh, things that the authors oftentimes say in their texts. Uh, for instance, they are shocked by the scatological humor of Gu Gulliver's travels or stuff like this. Uh, they're shocked by the savagery of the attacks on opponents in certain ways. They're shocked by the attitude here of Swift seeming attitude towards the Irish and specifically the Irish Catholics. Uh, he implies that they are oftentimes unfaithful. He talks about how they uh, lack self-control around certain moral habits and what have you. Um, he talks about how we can reduce their numbers and therefore their threat. Um, they're shocked by the savagery of these sorts of things dressed up in such genteel language. But that's very typical of the 18th century. And authors like Swift know about that tension and play with it deliberately and artistically. And I think that's a, a, one of the keys to really appreciating what they're doing. This is the beginning. It's it's we don't associate pragmatism with it or pragmatist philosophy, but I think it begins when uh, calculations are taking place. Then it's just the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, that we're not far from that sort of philosophy, and the philosophy of pragmatism is arguably the uh, leading philosophy that is used in calculations to this day. You could say that the the uh, mathematics of Swift's age have given away the computer modeling of our age. Yeah, the algorithms of uh, search engines and things like that, and uh, marketing trends and things. Or like even that. in relation to the you know COVID nineteen, the you know 
calculations of what the damage will be, et cetera, and thereby, et cetera. Yeah, this is a good point. And of course, this is illustrated in my view quite uh, strikingly in that famous quotation by Joseph Stalin, the death of one man is, is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. Yes, that's right. And that's exactly, we're back into the dynamics of dehumanization. Yeah. And Stalin knew it. Um, yeah. So there's an enormous irony that's fostered between, you know, uh, the, the style and the content as literary types like to talk about it. Um, and of course, all of that is bound up with irony or ironeia, if we're going to go for the Greek here, um, the tension between what is said and what is meant, what is written and what is meant uh, and how the, the, we play with that. But I think this is one of the, the reasons why satire is perhaps not as dominant in our age as it was in their age because irony requires an extremely subtle and sophisticated sense of the normal in order to detect the contradiction as it comes up. And I think as, we, as uh, culture gradually loses a sense of normalcy and the boundaries and things of that nature, irony, uh, irony becomes harder and harder to deploy. And so I think uh, the satire, particularly of the 18th century, is sometimes a hard sell for my students. And I have to, f I find myself explaining the joke a little bit too much at times. Um, well, there was a study a few years ago it said that something like 60% of millennials don't know the difference or don't care to know the difference between right and wrong. Mm. Um, this is, um, I don't think, a natural state of affairs. I think this is a... Uh, conspicuous societal educational platform that would eradicate that sense of right and wrong, which everybody, I would say, innately has when they appeal to uh, injustice or a sense of fairness, they are appealing to a sense of right and wrong. But to lack that sense, I think, takes a great deal of educational um, misinformation for that conditioning for that to be the case, but I think it is in fact the case. Well, to add a bit of encouragement to your statistic, I heard another statistic, we're operating here as you can tell in the spirit of Jonathan Swift, <laughs> um, which uh, purported that according to most measurable metrics, the generation following the millennial generation, Gen Z, Gen Z, depending on where you're listening to this, um, looks set to be by most measurable standards, the most conservative generation since World War II. So I don't know if that's a backlash or what that is. Um, and uh, I would like to see uh, more exploration of that potential tendency. But it's an interesting, and when I heard about the study, I was immediately very interested by this. Yeah, you mentioned that to me. It's, uh, I find that uh, encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he, he enumerates, so one of the strategies, in addition to using satire in addition to writing a parody because what he's writing a parody of is the sort of manuals making exactly these sorts of arguments of uh, citing statistics and making the most lurid ethical uh, or, or policy proposals um, all done with an aristocratic demeanor um, and written underneath a perfumed wig no doubt uh, and then enumerating the benefits to the policy, which he then does, and he lists them and numbers them. And the numbering is also significant because the, with the numbering, there's no hierarchy per se. It's just first point, second point, but there's no logic to the position. It's more, it's the accumulation of facts as if the accumulation of facts, the sheer, um, you know, the sheer deluge of facts would make it an overwhelming proposal. Um, in we, we saw last week that this is exactly the strategy that Satan used to overpower Eve, just yeah. pow overpowering her with a whole series of specious arguments, but there was a large number of them, and all of them seemed to have something to them. Well, this is exactly what Swift does to his audience. Yeah, and he's very clever in doing that. He, he convinces quantitatively rather than qualitatively, and so you're hit with a barrage of stats and figures and what have you that really don't care about your feelings and uh at the end of the day there's so much of it you think to yourself that the, the mass has convinced me um and i don't really have to engage in high quality reasoning to assess the argument i'll just assess the mass of it and there's so much of it that obviously he's got a point and we should follow uh the policy directives as he's outlining them here in a modest proposal and this also ties into another thing that you and i were talking about again 
around John Milton, which is that this is a, an age which potentially can prioritize causes over reasons. Um, yeah, we see a lot of that in the 18th century here. And I think this is one of the critiques that is implied in a modest propo proposal. Uh, we're not given reasons for why we should proceed as we should. Uh, we have a causational chain laid out for us, but that's a different creature and it can't do a lot of uh, ethical work. Causes can't necessarily do ethical work. They can help us to understand things a little bit better, but for that, we need reasons, we need intentionality, we need all these other sorts of things that go along with it. Um, and also, with that, a sense of personhood. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And this is one of the things I think that is being lamented here, like we're losing our sense of personhood. I can't remember the name of the character in Tolstoy's War and Peace, but there's a father figure of one of the two main uh, characters in War and Peace who is entirely given over to a, a very caricatured uh, sort of mentality uh, as it arises out of our discussion over here. A man, a sheer positivist logic and reason and what have you. Uh, and of course, his personal relationship with his children and his wife and people around him is an absolute train wreck. Uh, but nevertheless, reason is going to dominate every aspect of what's going on here. And he operates according to causes, not reasons. Um, another thing here that we see rhetorically, and this is just a quick aside, there's, there's um, I think it's called apoph apoph apophysis, I'm probably mispronouncing that, whereby um, Swift uh, mentions, he enumerates a whole bunch of things at a certain point. I thought of this because you're talking about quantitative approaches, um, where he talks about a bunch of things that we're not gonna be talking about. And so that's that's a strategy uh, since the ancient Greek and Roman times. Never mind this thing that we're not going to talk yeah. about. And of course, and in doing so, you're talking about it and bringing it up. Right. And so he has a whole list of those. Uh, he's got a full paragraph of those at a certain point where he hits you with those. So it's kind of a clever rhetorical strategy you know, on the micro level now as well. Yes, we're not going to talk about the fact that you used to beat your wife. Yes, that's Let's the class. We're not going to we're not going to engage in that sort of s slanderous behavior. Let's talk no. about something right but of course by that point everybody <laughs> in the audience is thinking what this man right but we're not i'm not going to talk about it but of course now that's and i'm not allowing you to address the scurrilous charge then right and nobody else is thinking of the calm reasonable thing that you're going to talk about after you do that they're that's, only thinking about the scandalous thing you're quote unquote not going to talk about right and that's going to poison the whole conversation yeah yeah, and he he follows also. I mean, there's a lot of classical machinery to uh, to the way in which he structures his overall essay. This is another, by the way, another literary form that comes to the forefront during the 18th century. Uh, the essay, uh, and uh, so a lot of people, a lot of my students are shocked when I tell them in the 18th century, especially as we move on through it, a lot of people are sitting around reading essays for pleasure. They're reading them for pleasure. Um, and my students are shocked. I thought they only had academic work to do. And after you got the knowledge, you just moved on and left the essay behind. No, the well-crafted essay was also a work of art. And so we find this here uh, as a, the modest proposal as an essay, but also for entertainment reasons and for reasons of conducing to wisdom and so on. Yeah, and so that's good. That's a good point. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a modern form of writing for sure. It begins in, with Michel de Montaigne. And uh, Francis Bacon also writes uh, his magnificent essays, and they really are masterpieces in both cases. Yep. But they, but even that is a sort of a, an essay is a thought experiment. Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's a foray. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, out this idea. Yep. Uh, by the way, since you mentioned Francis Bacon, Francis Bacon's thinking was actually one of the thinkers who uh, so distressed Swift around issues like this, because uh, he would have thought to some extent of Francis Bacon and his ilk as kind of social engineers again. Okay. Um, these are exactly the kind of people who need to be brought to heel. Mm. So. Indeed. Well, I'm going to conclude with the uh, his final paragraph here, and then uh, we can move on from there. He, he, sa he confesses, I, I profess in the sincerity of my heart that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country, by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old, and my wife passed childbearing. He has, no skin, in, he has no skin in the game. He's, he's absolutely altruistic <laughs> here. 
Yes. <laughs> Selfless, this fellow. It reminds me of the, the the classic James Bond line just before he shoots someone. It's nothing personal. Right. Nothing personal. <laughs> really. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent stuff. Uh, Where are we Scott, going next week, Bill? We are moving into the realm of Samuel Johnson uh, and the essays of Samuel Johnson. Um, now, what I'm about to say is a little bit contentious. Uh, there's lots of people, doubtless, who will disagree with me, but I consider Samuel Johnson to be one of the be best prose stylists writing in English, historically. Um, and not only that, much of what he writes in his essays um, is fascinating stuff, interesting stuff. And in addition to that, the man who writes them is in many ways very, very different than Jonathan Swift here. He's a fascinating individual uh, with quite an extensive secret life, uh, if we're honest. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully uh, the listeners will find that to be of use. Great. Bill, thanks so much. So I'm Scott Masson with Paideia Today again, once again with Bill Friesen. Uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you again next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you.